On today's show, we break down Houston Rockets draft prospect Amon Thompson, his offense, his defense, strengths, weaknesses, potential fit with the Houston Rockets, and projected draft range, all of that and much, much more. What type of impact would Amon Thompson have on this Houston Rockets organization? How well would he pair with Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr.? All of that and more coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as Rockets Watch. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, where you can help us out tremendously by commenting anything below. Give us your thoughts on Amon Thompson, what you think of him as a draft prospect. We will definitely be sure to check those out. Joining us now for a little draft prospect discussion is none other than Nathan Fogg, the founder of the TN Rockets blog. Did we did we officially rename this to Draft and or, T, or Rockets and Draft blog? Well, what's the new name uh, of it, Nathan? T and Prospects. There yeah. we go. I went looking for it and I was like, I remember there was a a nice little jingle to it now. And so T and Prospects. There we go. You can follow Nathan on Twitter at Nathan Fogg. One Nathan, it has been far too long. We had you on the show all last season breaking down prospects, but I'm glad to have you back on the program man yeah we had too much early season optimism where we we didn't you you thought you didn't need me but you need me now more than ever oh man rockets twitter rockets fans are in complete shambles and when when the shambles start when when the sky is falling that's when we turn our gaze towards the nba draft and what better way to do that than look there's a lot of hype surrounding Victor Wimbenyama, Scoot Henderson, and deservedly so, right? Those are the two guys that are at the top of pretty much everybody's draft board. Maybe there's a few draft Twitter heads who are, you know, getting a little spicy not having Scoot Henderson number two, but I digress. Let's focus. We're not going to talk about those two guys today. We're going to go a little bit further down the list. We're going to start with Amin Thompson, who is a guy that I am really excited about. I know, I, I think you're really excited about him too, Nathan, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, he's like a, a really interesting prospect to, to, uh, to scout. And just, and just let, let's start right here at the top. I guess this is, uh, you know, as good an intro as any. I mean, is there is there a world? Uh, I mean, first off, I, I'm, you know, very excited about the addition, you know, the possible addition of Wimby or, or Scoot. But uh, Thompson, to me, just he has this skill set. And we'll, we'll kind of start focusing on his on his offensive side of things. And we'll get into maybe some of the concerns with uh, his his shooting and, and kind of get into the defensive side of things. We'll talk about his potential fit with the Rockets, uh, you know, the expected impact that he would add to this team next season. But when you look at this guy, he, I feel like he has that skill set of a, a true, like, primary creator and engine, if you will, which is what I feel like this Rockets team is kind of sorely missing at this point because they're still trying to, you know, square peg, round hole, KPJ is the primary distributor. And I think we've got enough of a sample size to know that this probably isn't the long-term answer for this team. And so when you look at a guy like Thompson, you're like, oh, this this guy this guy could be that long-term answer as the primary creator. Yeah, I think, like, obviously, when Benyama and Scoot are better prospects, but um, if, you're like, if you're a Houston fan and you've been watching, you know, um, this team without a point guard player for a year now, it's the most exciting kind of addition to your team is to add a playmaker, um, like a, high, a real high-level playmaker, someone who can see the just if you just added Armin Thompson to this team, so much more stuff would become possible for the, for the offense. Um, you know, the whole court would become open. Right now, the, the court isn't open just from, a, just from a geometrical point of view. Like there are passes that just aren't available to Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green. I think Kevin's got a little bit better at some of his skip passes, but it's not anywhere near consistent enough. And with Armin, like he can pass left, right, behind himself. He, he any the whole court is open in a way that it basically was with James Harden. Although he, like some of the right left stuff in the corners was a bit trick of him, but it that just does anything, everything for your offense. Where like you could be stood anywhere on the court as a, as an offensive player, and like you are a passing option for the point guard. That is not a luxury Houston's had, and teams can shade off players and help off players. And there's there's kind of like blind, like if you're in a car, you've got a blind spot. Like our point guards. 
our guards had blind spots in their in their passing game. So Armand just immediately makes it a sort of 360, you know, 3D court where like, you know, real NBA offense is possible again. So um, he might not be the, the prize creme de la creme prospects, but I don't think anyone fits a need for Houston more than just having good players. Uh, I don't think anyone fits a more specific need than, than Armand does as a real special, special, special playmaker. Yeah, I, I again, I, 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 there's there's a lot of excitement for those first two names, but I think Thompson deserves a, a good bit of his, of excitement as well, just for the skill set that he could potentially provide to you know the Rockets or to, to really any team. When you look at his play style, though, do you, I mean how how would you best describe him? Uh, describe kind of his offensive game, his feel for the game for anybody for somebody who hasn't watched him play you know a single minute to this point. Uh, first of all, watch Armin Thompson because it's like really fun to watch. He's like <laughs> is, a real. Is. I will I will yeah. co-sign that. <laughs> Yeah, his highlights are like crazy. Um, and he's played in a league where like all the game is highlights, basically. Um, he's like a real high wire, incredible, incredible athlete in, in the likes of, you know, Jalen, um, Ivy, um, you know, John Moran. He's more like John Moran than as a point guard, he's kind of a the Moran type where he's really slippery and you know, he's not the bully ball rust type. He's really just because he I mean he's six seven, I think. Um, so a really tall point guard, which is great to have in the NBA, really, ex, you know, extreme explosive leap, extreme, uh, extremely quick first step, um, and has this vision of a playmaker in, uh, as the likes of Josh Giddy and LaMelo Ball, that are just really rare to see. And he can make these really flashy passes, which are just exciting to the team. You can imagine him running in transition with Jalen Green and KJ Martin, if he's still here, and just being Houston being like the top of a league pass team. But he's also just like a really solid, fundamental, high feel player for the game. He, you know, when he gets doubles, it's immediate. Like he can just get doubled in the third quarter after five games have never been doubled. And it's like immediate pick up. Like he knows exactly what to do. Like the team could go into the opposition, could go into a zone and it's like, bang, immediate hit to the middle. Like he just makes these instant reads where he's just kind of unflappable in a sense uh wait, wait 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 you're allowed to know what to do when a zone happens i, don't, I, don't, I think do. i think that's illegal yeah no you are allowed to actually like make the really obvious pass to the middle um and like pat like you will never ever ever see shengun posted up on a six foot two point guard and thompson not passing to him or like jalen hitting three threes in a row and armin not passing to him or like kevin Porter jr on a catch and shoot and armin not passing he just makes those obvious like we say obvious but clearly they're not um the, you know, he's just so his feel for the game is unlike anything. Like, if you remember, like Jalen, those double teams he got, even in the summer league, we were all like, oh, this is struggling, but you know, it's what he needs to see. Um, and there's so many pl- even better kind of playmaking guards than Jalen, um, who who kind of get that. Armin just is so press resistant right now and so calm on the, on the court. Um, and obviously, he's playing at a lower level, so I, you know, it might change in the NBA, but he's just his feel for the game is way beyond his years right now. Yeah, I was that that's kind of the other thing is right with, you know, him playing with, you know, in overtime elite, it's how does that make it we we've had this discussion before about, you know, is it harder to evaluate prospects from, you know, a collegiate standpoint versus the G League standpoint? You know, how at least to you for the, you know, to this point, how does it feel trying to evaluate the Thompson Twins, you know, with them playing in a completely separate league? Mm-hmm. I think it's like it was like fun at the start, and then you realize every game ends, you know, with a 30 point blowout, and you know, they're sitting the fourth. I mean, they're only playing like 22, 24 minutes a game, maybe a, a, a take more now, but they're sitting a lot of the fourth quarter. Um, I think you see a lot of um, draft people who are always extremely polite, who want to give like OT the flowers and say, like, look, I mean, I know everyone hates college, so like you're trying to look for uh, other avenues. And I think like I respect the Jalen for going to the J League, making some money. I respect what the Thompson terms are tied to do. But like you just have to call it as it is, which is like this is like a pretty disastrous element of com- competitive play. Like they're just not, play- you know, they had a game. Um, I can't remember which team it was. It was like a couple of weeks ago, and in the first quarter it was like thirty to seven, and like it was just transition dunk, transition dunk, transition dunk. I've literally never seen a, a basketball team as bad as this opposition was, and they were just. It was just, um, you know, steal at the top of the key dunk, steal at the top of the key dunk. They couldn't pass, and like it just led to all this like. You know, looking like, looking like an all star game almost. It did. It did. It just looked like a like a fun. It looked like a dunk contest. Like someone gives a ball and you get like a sixty yard run up and do whatever you want. And it just wasn't conducive. It just didn't teach me anything. And it's such a small sample size anyway of these games that um, yeah, like the thing that really um, concerns I think most evaluators with Tom, with both Thompson twins um, is just how much of their game is in transition, which won't happen in the NBA. So if you look at Armin Thompson's 
points per possession stats. He's like in the 96th percentile in transition. But he's only in the 60th, I think, sorry, 54th percentile in the half court. So we don't see enough of these half court possessions. He doesn't see enough of these half court possessions to really get better, where he's really having to figure out how to unlock a, de- a set defense um, rather than just, we know he can run really fast and dunk really fast. And he also has lots of really mo- like good moves. It's not just that he's an athlete. He's got a lot of craft around the rim. He's really slivery, but learning how to really unlock a defense is something that he's not having to do right now uh, in the half court, which is, which is a problem. Coming up, we'll shift gears. We'll take a look at the defensive side of things, as well as the kind of biggest concern with uh, Amin Thompson is, you know, will a shot, you know, translate ever, you know, at the at the next level? We'll take a look at that. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Next game, how about Jalen Green to score less than 26.5 points because he's been kind of struggling as of late. What about Alper and Shingun to have more than 7.5 rebounds? Kevin Porter Jr. to have more than 3.5 assists and Jabari Smith Jr. to have less than 3.5 three-pointers made because he hasn't been able to hit anything from long distance, unfortunately, as of late. So what is prize picks? Basically, it's daily fantasy sport. You you pick two to six players, and if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 25 times back on your money on any entry that you submit. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. That's NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college, you name it. They've got you covered over at prize picks. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that simple. Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up to play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, PrizePix will give you $100. If you deposit $50, PrizePix will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Nathan, I know I said we would we would change gears here and 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 talk about, you know, shift to the defensive side of things here in just a moment, as well as talking about maybe the the biggest red flag in Thompson's game, which is the, the shooting. Uh, but I, I want to put you on. I'm going to put you on the spot here for a moment because I'm curious. You talk about Thompson's feel for the game, right? And and it is it is really unique watching the way that he's able to have that like almost instantaneous recognition of how to break something down, or if he gets you know a flash double team or something, finding the open man, because um, that's something that we haven't seen like a ton of, right? We've seen like Kevin and Jalen like they even struggle at times just getting the ball like over the top to Shingun like in a pick and roll, you know, having those those split seconds to make those reads to to find the open man. So as far as just feel for the game. Who would you say right now has a better feel for the game between Scoot and Amin Thompson? I think it's different. I think like Armin is really good at like just taking over and with that aggression and like the shot making. But in terms of kind of vision, uh, like like obviously it's it's Armin by by a mile. Um, I think I think Armin is more. Um, he just has to do more as a playmaker and kind of a table setter, whereas Scoot gets to be more of just um, make shit happen with his aggression and his force kind of thing. So I think like I would probably give a, t- a bit tip to Armin, but it's kind of a different, very di- very different style of players, I would say. Okay, all right, I, and that's that's why I sorry for putting you on the spot. I was just curious yeah. because that, that's that's been kind of one of the things that stood out about Scoot Henderson. Is I feel like he has a good feel for things, but I think you're right. He, the, the expectations are a little bit different for their respective teams and what they both have to accomplish. Yeah, on also, night. Scoot is like playing in the G League, which is just way ahead of over time in terms of competition. So I, I guess maybe it swings back his way in that in that sense. Got it. Okay. Well, with with that, you know, we've we've had this discussion before on this very podcast about concerns for you know shooting, right? When you look at a player and, and you look at a player who who does struggle to shoot the basketball, how worrisome is that when you look at you know all this, all the other talent, all the other skills that you know Thompson possesses, but then you look at the shot and you're like, okay, you know, is the is that a red flag for you, Nathan? Do you do you think that's something that can be worked on? Where where is your concern level? Where's your panic level at regarding his, his shooting it's, stroke? It's quite high. Like if you listen to people on Twitter, they all say, "Oh, it's fine. They'll be fine. NBA teams can teach anyone how to shoot," um, which is not true at all. Like that, players struggle in the NBA. Uh, this is why we have averages that everyone can't be above average. That's not how averages work. Like players struggle uh, when they come out of. I mean. 
There are plenty of players who have improved significantly. There are plenty of players who never have. Uh, and there have been rebuilds destroyed on the back of signing, drafting players who you think you can teach how to shoot. Arlen's different because, you know, he's not like some six eight wing who's only really athletic and can't do anything off. And like all the players that OKC or Orlando drafted for like a decade, right? Arlen's obviously different to that. But, you know, his shot is really bad. He's really broken. He's really bad. Um, uh and it's, you know, he's he's misses, he's shooting like 20% in this regular season on nine games, I think 26%, including the preseason. His misses are really bad. His base is really bad. His follow-through is really bad. His balance is bad. Like the way he, when he lands, he like jumps a foot in the air to the left every time, which is really weird. Um, there's a lot to work on. And I think like, I don't know how many pay rises I've advocated giving John Lucas uh, over the last few years, but give John Lucas another pay rise immediately when we draft him because there's going to be a lot of work on that shot. Um, and it's gonna, you know, if he's gonna be a a, a low, I and mean, he, you know, he could genuinely be like one of the worst shooters of all time in terms of a point guard who takes shots, not in terms of like a seven foot who never shoots. But if he's as bad as what he looks like now, and he's in the twenties uh, percentage wise, then that's gonna be a real problem for him. No matter how athletic he is, no matter how good he is at, you know, they'll run, you know, defenses go under him on screens. He'll set kind of wider angles and try and beat them in a foot race. That works. He'll call for late screens. Um, so the defender doesn't have a chance to kind of understand what's happening. The best thing he can do right now is just to play in isolation, not call for a ball screen at all. So like the, the defense doesn't have a chance to go under him. In, in pick and roll ball handling, I think he's 55th percentile, but in isolation, he's like 95th percentile. Because you don't need a ball screen when you're Armin Thompson. It's, you can just beat anyone one-on-one. -on -one. And the good thing about that is like, He's so good at hitting the dunker spot. The dunker spot pass is his most automatic pass, I think. So if you just have the sense from the dunker spot, he's going to hit him every time. Just It's just an automatic read, perfect every time, just right in the hands. And so I think like he has a way to really succeed just as an isolation scorer in that sense. Uh, and obviously, like I'm going to tell you, like I hope his shot improves. And like, I'm sure he works on it really hard. Like He is known as a, to be a really hard worker, but... If you're like swatting away real concerns that like he could be a real bad shooter, then I just don't think you're being serious enough. What when, when you look at a player like this, what percentage in your mind would be acceptable given the rest of his skills? Like what number are you looking at where you're just like, get it to this number. And then because you do everything else on the floor, because you have all this else, you know, all this in your bag, this would be a cool number. I think like 33% is high end and that's like one point per possession which is like not a bad backup if you're just getting turned away by the defense and the thing about like 32 33 percent is like sometimes you're going to shoot 40 percent and you're going to hit like six shots in a row and sometimes you're going to hit zero shots but like there'll be a bit some variance there at least um but like yeah if you could tell me right now armin thompson is going to hit 33 percent for his career then i'm just thinking like he is like give me give me him now <laughs> like, I, that would be great that'd be amazing but like he could shoot 26 percent like, and that would be terrible. That, that's a big difference there. So um, that's um, I, I, if he can get to low thirties, then then we we cook and we gas a little bit. And and especially that if he can hit some unguarded catch and shoot shots, because I would like to see him in the first few years play some off ball, learn how to cut, learn how to play off ball. And I also think that would help him a lot because it's going to be such a huge step up from overtime to NBA. It's really actually think going to be. I think if you just put him on this team right now. I think it would be unfair to him to just say you have to play against NBA defenses when you're basically playing against high school kids right now. And you and, and he's a point guard, which is the toughest position everyone says to come into the league and play. So like if you could play him off ball a little bit with other guards, uh, other point guards, then I think he can learn and he gets to work on his shooter as well. I think that's what I'd be hoping to do for the first couple of years. Don't worry. Playing off ball and being thrown in the corner is the Steven Silas development hmm. special. So oh, it's going to actually work perfectly for him. There Except, we go. You know, yeah, he's going to be allowed to cut and move and things and do all the stuff. It's fantastic. No, when so when you're looking at his game, is there is there because I haven't watched him nearly as much as you have. I've seen enough to have a have a general feel for his game. But is there anything that stands out as far as like his ability, like in, you know, when he is attacking, like, is he is he super like, you know, right hand dominant? Is he is he more is he comfortable going both ways? Is there anything any other red flags in his offensive game besides the the shooting? Because that's obviously the biggest one. Any other like part, you know, cause for concern. I think like, play. So I think it ties in with shooting as well, because we're looking for touch and what else can you, what can you look at for shooting that isn't just a three point percentage. And one little tiny sliver of hope is he's shooting 81% from a free throw line in the nine regular seasons game. It was like 68% in the preseason. So if it, that carries over for the rest of the year, whereas in the eighties, then we're starting to look, uh, you know, a lot happier. I like his mid range game in the way he gets to the shot. So when he gets turned away, he's got these really pretty 
falling away, like tough, you know, the Kobe shot kind of thing. And like he's hitting 40% on dribble mid range jumpers, which isn't efficient or good, but it's not terrible. Like, Ken Porter Jr. is shooting like 43% this year. I think a lot of people would say he's doing really well as a mid-range jumper. At least that's what I see in my mentions uh, sometimes. Um, I would say he's not actually doing that well. But you know what I mean? Like, it, that's not a terrible start, like, c- considering how bad his his three-point jumper is. I think the one thing that is a misconception about Armin, though, which I think I really need to hit on, is his finishing at the rim. So if you look at just his finishing at the rim numbers, he's shooting like 75%. But so many of those are open transition dunks, whereas... If you try to filter it out, if you just look on synergy at layups, not dunks, he's which isn't a perfect measure, obviously, but it's just kind of a rough and ready guy. He's more like 59%, which is quite average. And I think what happens is he just hasn't judged yet how to finish using the backboard a lot, actually. He really misjudges where to hit it on the, back, uh, on the backboard. It's either too flat or too heavy. And it's not a problem with him getting to the rim. It's not a problem with where he's releasing it from or like his footwork, I don't think. I think he's got a really, a lot of craft around the rim. Like Jalen's got a really great first step. He doesn't have much craft around the rim yet. Armin really does. Like he can, he has insane like vortex spin moves and like great like up and unders and you know, he can split defenders. He can go left, he can go right. He just, so everything is perfect up until about uh, uh, just releasing and hitting off a backboard, I think is like his biggest mid judgment, which seems like something that is very fixable. So right now, like, his finishing needs to improve, but I think it will. I think he needs to improve on his gather. A lot of his turnovers are when he's gathering the ball to go up on the, on the pen. But other than that, like, I'm, I think he's a very um, exciting force at the rim, uh, which will just absolutely devastate defenses, um, especially with his kick-out passing. The other criticism that I've seen is is that while he is crafty and he's got like the array of like handles and he's able to split and, and attack, that the, the handle can be a little loose at times. And that's something that I feel like we see with a lot of younger players. And that tends to be something that gets cleaned up, right? You can even look at like Jalen, right? He came into the league and his handle was super loose and he's, yeah. he's tightened that up over time. That's something that they work on. So I, I feel like that's, you know, a minor note, but something that can be, you know, easily yeah. ironed out over time. Um, Coming it's up, like we every oh. every guard you say that about, and every player you say um, don't over contest on closeouts, and it's like I just have that in every single note for every single prospect I've ever scouted. It's just the same <laughs> stuff you see all, all the time. There you go. That's that's the generic one. You just you just yeah, pepper that into every yeah. prospect. Yeah, there we go. Cover cover all of our bases. Coming up, we actually didn't get to talking about the defensive impact in this segment at all. We'll do that as well as talking about his potential fit with the Rockets, draft range, all of that. Coming up in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by. Bet online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis this season. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football, a college bowl season, basketball, you name it. They've got you covered over at BetOnline. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get all of your sports betting info. Right now, you can head over to BetOnline to take a look at who the odds on favorites are to win the NBA title this season, the 2023 NBA championship odds. Right now, the Boston Celtics leading the way at plus 400. Right behind them, the Milwaukee Bucks at plus 600. The Brooklyn Nets, plus 750. Golden State Warriors in fourth place at plus 900. And creeping into the top five, the Denver Nuggets at plus 1,000 odds to win this year's NBA title. So for all those odds and more, be sure to visit betonline.net to learn more about the trends and action available to you. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball, free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, where you can let us know your thoughts on Amin Thompson in the YouTube comments. Let us know your excitement about him as an NBA prospect. Nathan, let's very quickly here, just the defensive side, right? Because Amin's brother is the is the 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 defensive guru, the stalwart, whatever. And we'll talk about him in a later episode. But just give me a quick breakdown on Amin's defensive kind of fortitude at this point, what you're seeing out of him. I mean, so I'm gonna like diverge with I think what is I often see from a draft people, which is I don't think Amin is a, a good defender right now. Um, I think there's kind of um I don't want to like call out, but I think there's kind of like a, a lazy take with that. He's just, oh, you're penciling him him in as like, you know, there's like mock drafts, you'll have a little paragraph and it's like, oh, man, he's like a really good athlete, really good vision. And like, he can't shoot, but he's got the defense. And it's like, I don't think he does have a defense right now. Like that's a lot of projection. Obviously he's six, seven with like a six, 11 wingspan apparently. So he's got the he's tools been, to be a good defender. He's got the tools and he's got uh, speed and everything, but there are plenty of players in the NBA who have the tools and never be defenders. And like, he tries. The thing is with Armand is like, he's such a steel sort of gambit. Like he's just trying to get the ball. He overcommits to everything. 
I don't even, I'm, I'm guessing it's scheme, but like it might even not be. He just tries to trap every single ball handler and just flies out of nowhere and he's really aggressive. And like sometimes he'll like just fly out of nowhere to trap the ball handler and he'll, like, he'll end up behind him because he's like too fast like himself like, and like he's just out of the play. So he's just this really aggressive kind of roaming, just go for the ball, real nose for the ball guy, which if he scales it back could be very helpful. And you want him to be like a jumping in passing lanes kind of steals guy because that immediately launches your your transition and he's going to be dunking in like 1.2 seconds but as a as just a defender right now which in a not very high level league like he i think i think he gets beat out on ball in terms of uh his processing speed like he left right like crossovers he overcommits one way he's very easy to just get off his feet out of his stance he i think he gives up on his defensive stance quite a lot I think he flails of his arms quite a bit. So there's, there's a fine line between showing your hands and doing a PJ Tucker kind of like, trying to like, uh, get, you know, <laughs> trying to put somebody off, which is what Asar does really well. Uh, there's a fine line between that and then flailing, uh, which is what Armin does, uh, which isn't doing anything. I would say when like you're driving on into him, like you're driving at him, he is good because he's long, he's got the wingspan, he can shuffle his feet. And that's the st- sort of stuff you look at. He needs a lot more discipline, I think, and he needs a lot of, of work there. But he is apparently dedicated to it. He brings it up a lot. Him and Asara, very high work ethic, guys. He's not, if you looked at the highlights, you'd be, um, I think, forgiven for thinking, oh, this is kind of like some flashy dunker who doesn't understand the fundamentals of the game and doesn't want to defend and just wants to, like, do crazy highlight passes. That's not what Armin is. Like, he will try. He's just being in a system right now, which is allowing him to just kind of freelance a little bit on defense. And he has to be a much more in your stance, boring, conservative defense, which, um, you know, uh, he's going to need. But the, the good thing is he does have the tools at 6-7. But, like, the, you brought up Scoot Henderson. That's an interesting one. Would you rather have Scoot Henderson, who's really huge and really, like, good on ball, but he's 6-2? Or would you rather bet on the 6-7 guy who hasn't really proven it yet? That's a that's a that's a tough question and one that we will you know have to be pondering over these next coming you know weeks and and, and months. I yeah, sorry, I love the term freelance on defense. Yeah. A, yeah. That was when you said freelance, I started to chuckle. I just couldn't even keep the smile away. It was so funny. Um, do you? I mean, right now, right? So you know, I think you know maybe leaving a little bit to be desired defensively. Obviously, it's a bit you know a little bit kind of hard to gauge right now. But has the tools? Do you think? You know, when you look at him uh, uh, just conceptually, do you think he has the chance to be a better, like, you know, point of attack defender or somebody who is a better kind of off ball defender, like you mentioned, right? Playing passing lanes, using that length, and then being able to, you know, ignite and get out in transition? I think that's kind of put the ideal that you want. I, you know, I think you kind of want him as a low man as well as a lot. There's kind of two ways to do it, you know, and okay, so you've done it both ways. Russ collapsed from a perimeter. He tried to play the gap defense and the steals, then he would immediately collapse and try and get a rebound. Whereas now they have Josh Giddy behind weak side corner because he's their worst defender, really. And he just is, you know, two feet away from a ball. And so there's two ways you could do it, Armin. He's probably more useful as the perimeter defender jumping in passing lanes. But if you have him as a low, you you want him to get the ball immediately. Like he is the best. He's going to come into the NBA as immediately possibly the best outlet passer in, in the NBA. Like he is, it's like, I'm going to do a super clip, a clip of this on Twitter, but his transition to kick ahead passing is just perfect. It's, it's unbelievably good. Like I cannot stress enough how unbelievable his time. It's instant. It's just instant, and it's so accurate, and it's crazy. So like you want him to get the rebound, and you can live with him being the kind of undisciplined, doing my own thing a little bit. But with Houston, what what Houston really needs is on ball perimeter defense, like badly. And if the lineup is going to be Armin, Jalen, KJ. That's three guys who can't currently defend the point of attack. Um, and Jabari might get better, but he's also really long and struggles to get around screens and, and defend the pull-up. So if you put, paired him with a better on-ball defender, perfect. But I worry that that is something in Houston he would have to get drastic for better at. Okay. All right. And you, and you know, the, the idea we can kind of, you know, talk about a little bit of just the fit, you know, the, you know, the expected impact, I guess, with this Rockets team, if he were to be drafted by Houston, what would it look like next season? You're talking about, you know, the outlet passing the transition play, obviously you, it, it's tantalizing because you immediately start thinking about all the, all the opportunities that you should theoretically be able to get in transition with Amon Thompson and like Jalen green, right. Running a fast break and being able to play off of one another in transition. But then like, we also got like all that same messaging this year at Rockets Media Day that they were going to be like this fast-paced transition heavy team and then it just didn't happen. So maybe Amon Thompson is the guy that like pay, that changes that and maybe having a guy who actually will like 
take the rebound and like push the pace and transition and oh, look yeah, to kick yeah. the ball ahead, all of that. Maybe that just like overnight changes the Rockets, you know, drastically. Well, I mean, the, Kevin, you know, Kevin Potter Jr. is not a fast point guard. Uh, he's not a high, he, you know, look at what he's, look he's at, methodical, just like yeah, was. Steven Silas on the sideline, waving him forward every time. Same with Jalen, really. Like, and it's not like something that is a big knock. It, it's just his style and it doesn't suit what Houston uh, does. Um, Armin is immediately releasing it. So like as long as you get the rebound and a stop, like he, it's not even a, it's not even a, a, a thought process. It just happens instinctively. Um, it's just gonna get stops. And like, how do you get stops with Armin, Jalen, and Shengun on the court? Um, I don't think it's gonna be much better than what it is right now. Um, that's three negative defenders. Uh, unless Armin just really I think he's more dedicated, let's say. And I, and I, I, it's unfair to to keep comparing to Ken Pot Jr., but it's point guard to point guard. I think he's more dedicated to doing it on, you know, as a kind of for a living. He's dedicated to do it possession to possession basis. So I would just love to see him in, a, in an NBA team with, you know, uh, an NBA kind of coaching staff really asking him to just be on ball because he certainly has the wingspan and the tools. And, you know, even last year, like when Kevin really locked in, you did see the strength of having a taller point guard. Um, you know, I remember like the Suns game, like he swallowed up Chris Paul, like in, in one of the Suns games, like Chris Paul didn't score for the first half. And I think it was like an November game. That has kind of dissipated, and it's kind of we've lost that. But it, it felt like it felt like last season, especially yeah. Kevin progressed as a defender, yeah. uh, you know, quite a bit. And then that like just kind of, the regression happened this season. Yeah. It's like where where was where where did it go? Yeah, and like yeah, it, it, that I think that does happen with young players if they're on bad teams because they think like why do I need to try hard if we keep losing? So hopefully, if Houston adds some players and they are immediately like in more high leverage games and winning, then you get higher buy in from all of these guys. So just on that last note there, you're talking about, you know, potentially, right, you know, Houston maybe making, you know, adding some players. Obviously, there's been, you know, speculation, oh, you know, is James Harden coming back to Houston this offseason, right? The, the Rockets have all this projected cap space. What would you be looking at if the Rockets did draft Amon Thompson? What would his immediate impact look like to you, right? You kind of even mentioned earlier the idea of maybe it would be unfair to him to just put the ball in his hands and expect so much right out of the gate from him, maybe bring him, bringing him along a little bit more slowly. What to you should be the expectation then for his production level or, or how he immediately impacts this Rockets team if he's drafted by Houston? I think like the expectation should be low. If you don't have if you don't add anybody else, so it's just Armin, Jalen, KJ, Jabari, Shingun, or KPJ coming off the bench or, or starting a small forward, and they add a couple of vets that aren't really moving the needle that much, then I think next year would be an absolute it could be a disaster. Uh, in terms of a start, I think you might see firings and things because like just jumping to playing against, you know, Marcus Smart, like Drew Holiday and like even like Alvarado and Herb Jones, it's like that is so unfair to play, put on a guy. He's playing 24 minutes right now a game against high school players. Um, this is kind of like this really scary part of that like, after the end of a third year rebuild with the, with the intense pressure Houston will have to to improve next season to just throw, you're really throwing him into to the fire. And like he might just immediately fly, like he, he might be like Lamelo Ball, where a, a lot of people had a lot of questions about Lamelo Ball, and just he was immediately great. But even Lamelo was playing in like the A League, like he was playing against adult. Like Jason Tate was in the A League. Like Jason Tate is not a star player, but he's a good defender. He's gonna like give you problems. Like Bogut was the center. Like he's a crafty, like can knock you down and like kick the shit out of you type of player. Like Armin is not having to face that. So it's um, it's gonna be a real. I think like, I, my ideal situation for him. Um, would be to just give him multiple ball handlers and allow him to play 20 minutes a night against bench units, maybe. Give him 10 minutes off ball. So I think like he could work with Harden in that sense. If Harden would, would you would you bring him off the bench? Like in, in a world where maybe the Rockets brought James Harden back, would you if they still picked up Amin Thompson, would you yeah. maybe bring him off the bench and have him be the backup guard? I would I would try that, yeah. If he's if you think like he's amenable to that. But I think that's always something about the coaching staff know more than anyone how the player's gonna react. But like, yeah, I think um I think that is gives him the, the smoothest landing because I think it's got potential to be quite ugly at the start. And no matter how good he will be, and he will be very good, um, he's gonna. It's gonna be the 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 shock I think to the system playing in the NBA has a potential to be quite good, quite high. So, um, yeah, if oh you could play him off ball more, you could play him as you know a small forward, the shooting guard type of player. But multiple ball handlers would be a real help to him, I think. Um, so I think Houston would need to really commit towards. They really need to commit to not just throwing him in a read and react system like 
go and go and do your own thing. Like let's let's just give you let's just put a lot of nineteen year old on the team. They would have to make a real organizational commitment that how are we gonna foster this guy's development over the next four years and how are we gonna give him the best path to succeed. Last thing here before we because we, we we will get to a tankathon spin we have to do the tankathon spin on the draft episodes. It's one of the best parts of the, the draft episodes. But when when you especially now because we're number one on the draft there we go one. right yeah. best odds. Yeah. Um, so when you when you look at Amon Thompson and where he may land, I, I think again unless you're unless you've got some draft you know gurus out there who are trying to galaxy brain this thing, I think we can very almost safely say it's Wimby and then Scoot one two. Are, are you in agreement there with me, Nathan? Yeah, I'm trying not to watch one because it, it, I feel like crying every time I see a highlight. <laughs> trying, but yes, uh, presumably he is he is number one. <laughs> so so Wimby one, Scoot two. I mean, it, it, when you look at Amon Thompson, is he in your mind the absolute lock for number three? What do, or what do you think the like the lowest is that he could drop? Uh, I think he is. Yeah, I think he's very high likely that he could, he he is number three. Um, considering like he we already know of a competition level, we already know of a shot, and he's already basically penciled in there. I think if Cam Whitmore really comes alive in the second half of the season, starts playing more minutes and really shows more stuff off the bounce and like the free point shot becomes real and he becomes more of a the force that we for he would pre-injury, then I think he's got a chance to make it in, interesting. But like Nick Smith's injured now, possibly for the rest of the year. I think Anthony Black has a real variance on where he is. I I, I can't see him going third myself. Um, I saw that I think there are people who have Asar above Armin, um, but I just don't agree so yeah i think uh Armin is is uh close to a lock uh for that position close to a lock for three okay and then if he if he did slip at all like do you think yeah. he's still i mean probably still like what top five in your mind yeah definitely i think the only interesting thing is that you know obviously like orlando do they need another wing or would they, they need mm -hmm. a guard you know um san antonio has like plenty of wings like their two best players are wings like in terms of prospects other than Pertle. so this, it gets a bit interesting if those two teams are like three and four and Houston are five, whether we might have like a hope of getting Armin. Um, by the way, like just to set, I feel like I've been a bit harsh on Armin in this process. I'm just trying to set expectations. If if Houston gets a number three pick, be very excited because like we get a, a potential generational kind of like all star every year kind of player. I didn't think you were being harsh on. I mean, well, I felt like I felt like segment one was pretty glowing, honestly, okay. with yeah. the, the, the way yeah. we were talking. Because again, I, I'm incredibly excited about him, and I feel like I was excited about him going into the podcast. I'm even more excited about him now, having sat here and kind of talked about him, you know, at, at length with you, Nathan. But I, th that same kind of line of thinking, like if I see like if Charlotte lands with like the number two overall pick, there's a part of me that thinks like, okay. Would they yeah. draft Scoot? Like, like, or would they stick with Lamal Lamelo? Like, how does you know what are they? So there, I think there's a lot of that in this year's draft. Where like, depending on you know what team lands and what pick, you might get yeah. you know a little bit of variance. But with that, let's go ahead and we will uh, we will fire up the tankathon here, and we will see where the Rockets land. They do have the best odds currently at the top of the draft lottery. So the worst that they can land is pick number five. And why am I? I'm. I'm this is stressing me out already. <laughs> Like real. It's, it's January. Oh no, we're five months ahead of schedule. All right, here we go. Uh, oh wow! What? This is the best spin I've had so far. Victor <laughs> Wimanyama. They they stayed at number one. Here we go. All right, we 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 hyped up Amon Thompson that entire podcast just to land with yeah. Victor Wimanyama in Houston, which you know we're not going to complain about. That's a pretty nice, pretty yeah. nice outcome. Playoffs, baby. Playoffs. <laughs> Dude, I mean, Arden's look, coming back. We, yeah, we, Wimby, Harden, let's go get some vets in the mix. Uh, would be a lot of fun. But uh, look, that was uh, a great breakdown, Nathan. I, I sincerely appreciate it. We're going to be doing these draft prospect profiles, breakdowns moving forward throughout the remainder of this Rocket season and leading up to the NBA draft. Nathan, do us all a huge favor. Let everybody know where they can track you down at. Well, just on Twitter right now, and Nathan Fog one uh, two Gs. Don't forget the two Gs. That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also available on YouTube. Just go to YouTube. Be sure to search Locked on Rockets. Like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Let us know your thoughts on Amon Thompson as a draft prospect. I will read each and every one of those comments. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything. Houston. Houston Rockets basketball.